99.9% of DNA among individuals, humans, is the same in its sequence, in the A, C's, T's, and G's. But then it's this difference, it's this 0.1% difference that makes a difference, that really generates the differences in how we look, in our predisposition to diseases. And this is what we are after. This is exactly what we want to study. At Penn State's Center for Medical Genomics, that 0.1% is the starting point. Not just to understand the human genome, but to use it. To predict disease, personalize care, and push medicine forward. So we are looking for particular differences in DNA of humans, of patients, and we use this information to inform our decisions and decisions of practicing doctors about disease prevention, disease diagnosis, and also disease risk. The Center for Medical Genomics, or CMG, was built on the belief that decoding DNA isn't just science, it's service. This center brings together scientists from different domains including biologists, statisticians, computer scientists, as well as practicing physicians. Genomic science alone can't explain health. This work looks at how DNA interacts with behavior, ancestry, and lived experience. Epigenetics is a way for DNA to react to environmental changes. And now, like never before, we have an ability to look at epigenetics while we sequence the DNA of an individual. We try not only to understand how we get sick, but also why we get sick. And we think that deeper understanding also allows us to eventually come up with new therapies, more effective therapies. But at the same time, to really understand what the mutation is doing, what the context is, we need additional information uh, in collaboration with archaeologists, with medical researchers, even with climate researchers, we try to understand what is the context of those genetic uh, changes, these genetic adaptations in our history. We apply evolutionary models, uh, quantitative models, in order to understand how genetic variation uh, is distributed around the world, within and between people, populations, and uh, this gives us a reference point uh, for which we can say, oh, this is an exciting signal, or no, this is not an exciting signal. Our data tells a story, and it allows us to really see connections that otherwise, if we didn't study it in that way, we wouldn't be able to suss out the true cause. If we understand the process better, we could intervene upon it in some way. That might mean changing the environment that would then unlock um, a risk factor for someone. It could mean um, also some kind of medical genomics type of, um, uh, say, intervention or pharmacologic therapy. The immune system is complex, but it leaves patterns. Machine learning helps decode those signals, mapping how our bodies recognize disease, adapt to threats, and build internal defense libraries. All this starts from the genome and how it works. And because uh, the specific regions of the genome that are responsible for adaptive immunity, they work in a different way compared to many other parts of the genome, we do need a lot of specialized coding and tools. We're not alone in our own bodies. The microbiome, trillions of microbes living within us, interacts with our DNA in subtle, powerful ways. You've got your microbiome that's in your gut. You've got your genome that's in whatever cell it is in. And that information from your genome needs to get relayed into the middle of your gut. And so, you know, your genome gets transcribed and then makes proteins. Those proteins then travel throughout your body until finally they reach your microbiome. Um, so there's a lot of different steps all along that pathway that link up host genetic variation with your microbiome. Uh, and one of the really exciting areas that we're at right now is we're trying to figure out what that pathway actually looks like. And just like a game of telephone that you played as a kid, it's messy and it's complicated. And so we're spending a lot of effort trying to figure out exactly how that message gets transferred from your genome to your microbiome um, and how we're able to uh, intercept that at different points to modulate your microbiome. Health is shaped by more than DNA. This work models how environment, pollution, stress, nutrition interacts with our genome, 
revealing complex pathways between exposure and outcome. We've uh, tried to, you know, build these prediction models for coronary artery disease using patients' clinical histories, right? And from electronic health record data. And we're able to get prediction accuracies of close to 97% 10 years in advance. Understanding the genome requires more than biology. It requires math. This approach uses statistical models to find patterns in massive genomic data sets linking genes to traits and risk to outcome. We have an amount of data that is unprecedented, and in fact, it keeps growing. It keeps growing exponentially. This type of large, noisy, complex, often multi-sourced data expose you to a risk of seeing things that are not really there necessarily, okay? You may find some associations that are not really robust, so the techniques to analyze the data need at the same time to be very sensitive and capable of catching subtle signals, but also organized and possibly robustified, okay, in a way uh, that allows us to understand what are outcomes, what are findings that are in fact stable, robust, and what may be due to little quirks in the way the data is pre-processed and analyzed. Now, where I get really interested in is in this place where the data is imperfect. We know environment plays a role, but we may not measure all the important environmental factors. In fact, we may draw a conclusion about how genetics affects disease, and that conclusion could be confounded by our lack of measurement, our lack of knowledge about some important environmental factor. And that's really where my research focuses on, is in these types of data imperfections and how do we draw rigorous conclusions. How we analyze genomic data affects what it tells us and who it includes. This research focuses on statistical methods, fairness, and the structures that build or break trust in genomic science. So there's a curve, right? Utility, privacy, trade-off curve. As a statistical researcher or a computer scientist who are doing this, right, um, we can provide the curves and the tools, the metrics, but we feel that somebody with policy knowledge and law and regulatory landscape knowledge, they truly need to make a decision of where that cutoff point is. As genomic technologies advance, so do questions of privacy, consent, and ownership. This research focuses on the legal frameworks needed to protect individuals in the age of personal genomics. A lot of this information is very sensitive and very intimate about an individual, and we safeguard this information for each person very carefully. So we can draw from, for example, intellectual property mechanisms uh, like copyleft licensing to ensure that whatever ethical use parameters are put into place will be followed downstream by other deployers, say healthcare systems that might decide a particular tool or a set of information is useful uh, for their providers, but also the end users. Penn State has been a cradle of genomics research for over 30 years. But now CMG is more than a research center. It's a launch pad turning discovery into diagnosis and data into action. How we can learn about the differences among individual human genomes and how we can interpret this information, how we can use this information to study the development of diseases, the predisposition of diseases, and also uh, to learn how we can avoid the diseases to start with. This is the future of medicine predictive, personalized, and precise. Your treatment tailored to your DNA, your prevention plan shaped by your genome. And it's not science fiction, it's happening at Penn State.